I'm Emily Kumler, and this is Empowered Health. This week on Empowered Health, we are talking to a, an incredible multitasker. She was a four times CrossFit Games athlete, top performing. While she was doing some of that was in med school. She is now getting her residency as a family medicine doctor. I was really excited to talk to her because she's somebody who is, you know, sort of a celebrity in the CrossFit world and is very nice and sweet to hang out with. The few times that I have met her, I was really impressed by her. But I also feel like on a very personal level, I have been feeling like I'm doing way too much and maybe nothing very well. So over the summer, I wrote two books, which I actually really wrote in about a month. And obviously, I have two kids that I talk about on the podcast. I also run three women's wellness centers, the Prime Studios, and I write for Boston Magazine. And of course, we have this wonderful weekly podcast. And there are times where I feel like, oh my God, is this making me happy? Is all of this stuff really doing what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Am I driving impact? Am I helping people? Am I fulfilling something within myself? On good days, I say the answer to that is a resounding yes. And I think there's a lot of crossover between all of these different projects. So that overlap is really a sweet spot for me where I feel like things that I learn in, on the podcast that I can use at Prime and things that I learn at Prime or working with our managers or trainers, you know, I can kind of use at home. And so all of those things on a good day seem very symbiotic. But on a bad day, it feels like I don't want to do anything but stay in my bed and like sort of hide under the covers. This guest this week is somebody who is very, very positive and obviously very driven. She and I have a really honest conversation about health and women's health and how the medical establishment is very different today than it was, which is part of the reason that she wanted to go into family medicine because she wants to actually spend time with her patients, which I commend. But I also had a really honest conversation with her about a moment of real growth where she was very, very down and not sure why she was doing so much and why was she pushing herself so hard in her CrossFit pursuits and in med school and she was in a relationship and how she had a phone call with her mom that really helped her sort of put things in place and develop a plan forward. I'm not going to butcher her plan or what that experience was like. She'll do a much better job telling you than I will. But I will say for anybody who's thinking about New Year's resolutions as 2019 comes to a close or thinking about how they don't want to do a New Year's resolution because they don't tend to work out, I think Julie's philosophy on this stuff is really helpful for all of us to sort of put in place what is bringing you joy and what is driving impact. When it's sort of okay to be overwhelmed because it's for a specific purpose or a duration of time, and when maybe it's just too much. Hi, I'm Julie Fouché Urcuyo. I am currently a medical resident in family medicine and a former CrossFit Games athlete. Very passionate about health and promoting health through lifestyle changes and very excited to be here on the podcast. We are so excited to have you. So I feel like a lot of our audience is not familiar with CrossFit. It's just sort of a wide swath of women interested in health issues. So I thought a good place to start might be sort of talking about how your life as a doctor or deciding to go to med school really intersected with your introduction to CrossFit and sort of how that has impacted things, which is pretty dramatic. Yes, it is. And it's it's interesting to see. I think Actually, maybe other people in my life saw it more clearly than I did at the time. It took me a little while to figure it out. But I had always been athletic. I had always been very active and I did gymnastics growing up. I did track and field in high school. When I got to college, I didn't play any college sports. And so I felt kind of lost for the first couple of years. I was just going to the gym, doing the elliptical, doing the weight machines, kind of the usual things, reading my textbooks on the elliptical like everyone else in college. It was about halfway through college that I first heard of CrossFit. So this was around 2009. I was living in the dorms and this is actually when I met my husband. We were both in one of our mutual friends dorm rooms watching Grey's Anatomy of all things and he pulls up CrossFit.com on the computer and I started asking him all these questions and it just looked really interesting to me because 
it had a little bit of everything. You were doing something different every day. And then as I later found out, there was a huge community aspect, which is really what I was missing by not being involved in organized sports anymore. So it wasn't too much longer after we first met at that point that we both joined our local CrossFit affiliate in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then sort of the rest is history. That year, did some local competitions and ended up actually qualifying to the CrossFit Games in 2010, the following summer. It was shortly after that first CrossFit Games that I did my CrossFit Level 1 seminar. So this is a introductory seminar, which anyone can do. It is the seminar that you have to do if you want to call yourself a CrossFit trainer and you have to pass a, a test. But I really think anyone who's interested in CrossFit can benefit because you learn so much more about the methodology and the reasons why we do the things we do and the real meaning and purpose behind CrossFit. And as I was sitting in that seminar, there's a lecture where they define CrossFit and then they define fitness. And there's one model that's used to define fitness, which is called the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum, where basically you have a variety of different biological and physical fitness markers that you can put along this continuum from sick on one side to fit on the other and then well somewhere in the middle. And most of what we do in medicine is try to keep people well. So we try to make sure, you know, your blood pressure is okay, your blood sugar is okay, in this sort of acceptable range. But the problem with that is that then when something happens, which it's going to happen to all of us, we're going to get sick or something unexpected is going to happen and life knocks us down, it's really not a very far distance to fall before we get sick. And so the whole concept behind CrossFit for health is how can we push ourselves as far to the fit side of the continuum? So having markers that are even better than well, like you go to your doctor and you're, you know, they check your blood pressure and your heart rate and they say, hmm, you must be an athlete or you must work out because it's so good. How can we help people sit more on that side of the continuum so that when they do encounter challenges in life, they have to pass through well before they get sick? One of the things I think is so interesting about that is that I feel like one of the definitions that I've always like sort of hung on to when it comes to health is how we tend to look at things as like the absence of harm. Yes. Right? Rather than like being in tip top shape, you're thinking like, oh, do I have this chronic illness? And if I don't, then I can check the sort of healthy box, right? Right. And the continuum is so interesting because it actually shows you like, no, this is, there's a whole spectrum here, right? Right. Most diseases fall somewhere along that spectrum. So it's not like a switch that flips and all of a sudden you have diabetes just because your A1C is 6.5. You know, that's been brewing for many, many years. And all of a sudden it gets to this point of 6.5, which is what we've declared as diabetes. But it's something that, you know, we can catch far earlier and turn that train around. Right. And that whole idea of like chronic illness is just that, right? It's like the debilitation of your health over time. Right. And you can stop that at any point. I mean, before it gets too far, I guess. Absolutely. And we can put, you know, we talk about in the seminar, you can put other markers on that continuum too. So it's not necessarily just blood work or things you get checked at the doctor, but you can put, you know, if you're able to run a mile in less than 10 minutes, maybe you're well, but if you can run a six or seven minute mile, maybe you're more on the fit side of the continuum. And maybe if you're sick, you can't even walk a mile. You can put different, you know, physical tasks that we do in the gym along that continuum too. And the whole goal is just trying to maximize from every perspective, our buffer that we have against getting sick or having chronic disease or having decrepitude as we age. So why do you think that resonated with you the way that it did? So I think at that point, I was, uh, it was the fall of my senior year of college. And I was in the deep in the process of applying to med school. So I had just submitted my applications. I was starting to go on med school interviews. At that point, you know, I think I knew I wanted to go into medicine. What drew me to medicine most was the physician patient relationship, sort of the science and the bio, you know, the way the human body works has always been very fascinating to me. But at that point, I really thought I wanted to do, I studied engineering in college. And so I was always very focused on kind of knowing one thing really well and really understanding how it works. And I, I kind of saw myself being a specialist. And especially when I ended up choosing the med school I went to, it was really focused on training specialists and training research scientists. And I thought that that would be where I would 
be most comfortable is let me learn this one part of the body really well and um, be able to help people. I didn't get there for another year or so, but I think that's when the seed was first planted that, you know, there's so much more to health. And at this point, I think my general understanding of medicine in our healthcare system was so limited because I just wasn't exposed yet. And I didn't realize the magnitude of the problem of chronic disease. But that's where that seed was first planted that I that I realized there's a lot more to health. And as I started being exposed to some of the problems with our healthcare system and chronic disease in my first year of medical school, that's when it really became clear to me that I had a unique position to be able to help people actually promote their health and address chronic disease from the root cause in a way that we aren't really doing in our traditional healthcare system. Well, and I think that's so interesting too, because I feel like one of the things that comes across over and over, even in this podcast, is like how everybody is sort of specialized, right? And so the idea that you have to understand how the specialization works with the whole system, it really does feel like an engineering problem. That's sort of interesting that you come at it from the, that background too, because And then I think we have to get to like sort of what is family medicine, because you go from wanting to be a specialist to then thinking about the whole family, right? Which is like about as far from being a specialist as you can get, right? Right. It's the most general that you can be. So tell me how that happened. (laughs) So, and I think that's an interesting comment you make too about just how each, how the specialties work and how they're so, there are, there are a lot of silos. We try to make the body like way oversimplified. The body is so complex and all these systems are interacting, but the way that we've designed our medical system, we have people who are only focusing on one part of the body at a time. And, you know, it's good for fixing acute problems. It's really good for fixing acute problems. I mean, our healthcare system is fantastic at that, but I think we're running into bigger roadblocks now because, you know, we don't have the ability to see how all those systems are interacting. So I got to family medicine because I think it was after my first, it was around during my first year, after my first year of med school. And during that year, I actually competed in the CrossFit game. I wanted to train and compete and sort of prove to myself that it was possible to do during med school. And you did well. I mean, I think that's important to point out, right? That was my best. That was my best finish that year. Um, It was a rough year. There was a lot of ups and downs. But in the end, it was really, you know, it was an amazing year. And I'm so glad that I did it. And then as I went into my second year of med school, I knew I wasn't going to compete that year because the second year of med school was much more demanding. And there was a big board exam that sort of coincided with the game season. So I did a lot of reflection and I realized, one, I mean, I had this amazing platform that CrossFit had given me to be able to start having these bigger conversations with people about health and fitness. I realized that I, I could see what was happening in the gym. So during that first year of med school, I probably, I think we went every other week to a clinical setting where we would go in a primary care setting and sort of see patients and learn basic clinical skills. It was really striking to me because I would go and I would see a patient with diabetes or high blood pressure and we'd say, okay, you need to exercise more and lose weight and change your diet and here's another medication and we'll see you in six months. And they would come back six months later and really nothing had changed. On the other hand, I'm going to the gym, training every night, and there, of course, in involved being involved in the CrossFit community, you're hearing stories about people dramatically changing their lifestyle, losing a ton of weight, coming off medications for chronic disease, and it was a completely different picture. And so there, I really saw how important it is for people to be involved in a community that is supporting them and making positive, healthy changes, and for the regular interactions. I mean... The office visit is not the place where these types of changes are going to happen. You as a doctor have to also, I mean, like I assume you have to basically talk about the the dietary guidelines, right? Or that's like what most people would do. Like CrossFit obviously is more based on the zone, right? And like get off the carbs. Did you ever feel like you had to like sort of, I don't know, tow the party line at school knowing that you were getting this other information outside of school? I would say at times, I think it was just sort of a different mindset. And I think the way that I was able to see things was different than sometimes other people I was interacting with. But I would say over the course of the time, since I've been in school and in residency, our general 
understanding of diet and dietary recommendations has really changed in a positive way. So I would say it was probably more common back then that I would run into teachers or, or, you know, doctors who'd been in practice for decades telling their patients to, you know, eat low fat or, you know, various things that didn't necessarily make as much sense to me. And now we see that dietary guidelines have even changed. There's more focus on eating whole foods, on not eating processed foods. So you never felt like that was a conflict for you? Because I could imagine it would be. Just sort of being in that environment and knowing as much as you do about, you know, sort of what CrossFit recommends and the results that everybody talks about getting. Yeah, I would say, I mean, there was there was times where I where I'd kind of bite my lip where I wouldn't, if there was someone, uh, a preceptor that I had or a um, faculty member that was giving certain advice to a patient. And then I would always try to at least discuss it with them afterwards and just try to understand where they were coming from. And one time I can remember specifically, I think I was in an endocrinology clinic and there was a patient coming in who wanted to do a protein sparing modified fast for weight loss. I remember talking to this patient and like listening to what her diet was like and realizing, hey, if she she doesn't need to necessarily do that extreme of a diet, but maybe just by switching to whole foods and cutting out the sugar and making some other changes, she might have a really good result or move herself in the right direction. But she had never tried those things before. So I remember having a discussion that time with the faculty about showing them some data on the paleo diet and talking about different other options. And so it was just I think at times it was interesting to me the the extremes that patients would be going to in these very clinical settings without having tried other simpler things first that might be a little bit better for the long run. Yeah, that just feels so symptomatic of how much, you know, sort of confusing or misinformation is out there, right? I mean, most people have no idea what to do. And they think, you know, the whole like eggs are great, eggs are terrible. Like, you know, I feel like <laughs> we don't do a good job being really clear because the research hasn't been really clear, right? So I think that just creates a really dangerous situation that people fall into. And I mean, I think that's really part of the reason that we are where we are today. You know, it's interesting because I can imagine you as this like super healthy, fit person in med school hearing advice and like it'd be, I, it would be very hard for me, I guess is what I should say to like <laughs> actually keep my mouth shut. You know, I know there are situations where you have to do that. That's why I'm not a in any profession other than where I get to just like blab <laughs> away and say what I think because I wouldn't be good at that at all. So can you talk a little bit more then about like sort of how these two experiences are influencing each other? You know, it's not like you got your L1 and then we're like, okay, I understand this. Like you be, you really sort of like double down and become even more invested in CrossFit and the brand becomes invested in you while in med school, which is like kind of unheard of, right? Because most people like go to med school and you don't ever talk to them until they're done. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> right. hard to imagine doing anything else. Yeah, I've been very lucky the way that everything has worked out. So after that, I realized family medicine was definitely the right fit for me because I really wanted to be focused on helping to promote health and having these long-term relationships with patients and their families and how so much of this creating health happens not in the doctor's office, but inside, you know, within people's family units or what's happening with them, you know, in their work environment or their home environment or where they're spending their time. So what is family medicine? I mean, I think maybe you could just explain what that is because I'm sure a lot of people have never heard of a family doctor. Sure. So I guess back in the day, it was just a general practitioner, or I think in Europe, they still call it a GP or general practitioner. But family medicine is basically primary care, comprehensive care for the family unit. So we take care of patients, we say from cradle to grave. So in residency, we're trained to do everything from obstetrics to pediatrics to women's health, all the way up through nursing home. We spend time in nursing home care. In the past, I think family doctors in general had done very comprehensive care like that, especially, and they still do, especially in rural settings. I would say now in the U.S., especially if you're living in a more populated area, I think family doctors tend to do, to focus more in outpatient primary care for that whole spectrum. But there are certainly still a lot of family doctors who do inpatient medicine, who do even some, like I mean, we do office-based procedures, but I know in the past family doctors were even trained to do some um, surgeries, colonoscopies, things like that. 
Um, but obviously now those are done more commonly by different specialists. I mean, in some ways it makes so much sense, right? Because it's sort of like this idea of like your doctor coming to your house and like seeing the environment in which you live in, right? I mean, and I don't know if you actually make home visits anymore, but like just the idea that, you know, you'd treat like a husband and a wife and their kids and that you'd see similar things, right? Or like even things like stress levels, you probably are, you know, you're going to get a more accurate picture of that kind of stuff than you will just by seeing one member of the family. And we did a couple of episodes on um, maternal mortality issues. And there's a woman who had gotten her PhD or she had done like an advanced program at Duke. She um, did an amazing thing where she basically was sort of looking at the public health crisis and especially looking at black moms who were, you know, dying at these higher rates that are just completely unacceptable, right? Because it's like 60% of these deaths are preventable. She figured out that like if she could create a clinic environment where the newborn baby's appointment coincided with the mom's checkup, then the moms would come. But the way it is now, it's like you have to take your newborn baby to the doctor three times the first week they're home or whatever. And then like you're also supposed to go get yourself checked somehow, right? Right. And that that's just, you know, women, new moms especially, are going to always prioritize their baby over themselves. And that maybe we would catch some of these things, you know, especially like hemorrhages and stuff like that that are happening postpartum if the woman were able to show up to appointments and they do if it involves their baby. And I thought that's such a like sort of beautifully simple solution to the problem, right? Like make it more convenient. Think of these two, you know, as very different patients, but that one is going to prioritize the other and the one that is in charge of making that distinction is the one who is going to ultimately be at the most risk, right? Oh, absolutely. And I I feel like doing something like family medicine, you would probably be able to sort of counter a lot of that just in the way that you're talking about. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I would say that's a huge plug for family medicine, because if you have a family doctor, you can do that. And that's been one of the cool things about residency, where we do deliveries, and then we take care of the mom and baby in the hospital, and then we see them both in the office. And there is just great continuity of care there. And oftentimes we do, you know, if they if, if they no show or if something happens, you know, you can reach out and figure out what's going on. But I think there's so much that you learn. And I think I'm learning now, even as I'm getting further into residency and seeing more and more of my patients in clinic and seeing their different family members, you just learn so much about what's going on with the patient as you meet different people in their family and you kind of get an idea of what's going on in their life. And so that's really what I love about family medicine too, is that we really, I think, strive to keep the person at the center of their care. You know, we use, of course, we you know, we use all this data and all these things that we have at our fingertips. But at the end of the day, it has to make sense in the context of the person and what is most important to them. And so it is very much centered around kind of what the patient's priorities are and how can we help best help them with their goals and get the most out of their health and their life that they're looking for. Well, we also know that like, if you help, you know, that we often talk about, like, if you help a mother, you're really helping the whole family unit often, right? Because like, if you can get her eating better, being more healthy, she's going to then make those changes for the rest of her family. Like if you're trying to get everybody on like, you know, a better diet or an exercise regimen or whatever, like if you could get access to the whole family and be like, all right, you guys are going to do this together. Like I can't even imagine how impactful that would be. Right. Because so often it's like you hear that the mom is like, oh, my kids would never eat that. But then she starts getting great results or figures out that like, you know, this is actually really some of this could be like dangerous for the kids, right? If they keep eating tons of sugar. And that like there is sort of a responsibility to model better. I mean, I think that just makes so much more sense in a family medical practice rather than like a pediatrician saying it to the child, Mm -hmm. which is almost like kind of shaming, right? I mean, like the kid doesn't know probably right from wrong. And if the parents aren't eating well, I mean, I just like I can imagine all kinds of scenarios whereby it would be like you'd get the whole family to buy in on something like that would be tremendous. Yeah, when it works, I think it it is tremendous when people act, when people are motivated and want to make changes. And I would say I know pediatricians do a great job of talking to the parents and trying to involve the parents because obviously we know that the young kids are not making their own food, but they're making their own, their own decisions about what food is in the house. But sometimes it just comes down to 
the motivation of the parents and their understanding. And so I do think it helps you have a little bit more buy-in when then you are also the caregiver for the parent and you can talk to them about their own health risks and, you know, potentially if you can get them to buy in, then it does, it really does, like you said, trickle down to the whole family. Yeah. We had Shaka on a couple of weeks ago and, you know, I mean, I feel like she's just like amazing with her, like no <laughs> nonsense, like approach to everything. And she really was talking about like how she has to sit down with kids and like kind of just break down, like, why are you having juice? You know, maybe they're not tough talks, but like it comes down to education, right? Like if you don't know and you think you're getting your kids like organic apple juice and that's fantastic, like it's a lack of understanding. I don't think anybody's like trying to, you know, be malicious with their kids. I just don't think a lot of people understand. Yeah. And it's so hard to change, change our perceptions of these things, right? Like I think so many people just think, well, I grew up drinking juice and juice is what kids are supposed to drink. And they don't realize how it can have potential to be harmful. It's sort of the same, like I think back to even when you were talking about nutrition and going through med school, like when I talked about, oh, I'm you know, following this paleo type diet and I'm not eating any grains or I'm not eating any dairy, people are like, oh, well, that's impossible. You can't do that. And so it's, it's sort of changing people's minds. Like, do you really need juice or do you really need to be on your phone for three hours a day or sort of these habits that, that we think are necessary or that we think are impossible to break, but then actually stopping and breaking it down and thinking, okay, is this really good for me? And what am I actually getting out of it? And sort of look at the risks and benefits. So I actually, I feel like that's a great point to make. And I, you are somebody who I definitely feel like in terms of time management, I could learn a lot from you because it seems oh, like I don't know. <laughs> you have so much going on. But like, how do you make like, I feel like in the process of deciding that you're going to kind of do these two things that are both really intensive. I mean, going to the CrossFit Games is a huge accomplishment, right? And like, you've done it five times. Like, that's incredible. Yeah, well, four times. I didn't my last year, I tore my Achilles. So it was four times at the games. But I think I like I said, I've been really, really lucky the way that the timing of a lot of these things has worked out. And I think for me, my sort of strategy has always been just to really prioritize and decide what my priorities are at the time. And it's okay if they shift from time to time. So for example, you know, i competed in college, I did my first year of med school. And then I took a year away from competing during my second year of med school, because I knew it was just going to be too much. And so I really focused on school that year, I focused on working on some of my weaknesses in the gym. And then the med school that I went to was actually a five year program as opposed to the usual four years. And the fifth year, or it was somewhere in the middle for most people it was a year of research. And so what I did was I actually added on an extra year. So I did six years of med school and two of those years were research that I had basically spread out a year's worth of research over two years. And so that is what allowed me to compete for two more years in med school. So it seems like a lot, but I was sort of creative in how I made that happen and was able to sort of shift my priorities from year to year and kind of know where I was going long term. So even at the end when I retired from competing in 2015, you know, I, I was definitely the fittest I had ever been. I felt fantastic. I ended up tearing my Achilles at regionals, which was disappointing, but people would always ask me like, Oh, don't you want to come back? Don't you want to not end it that way? Do you want to try to go back to the games again? But I was so focused on, I mean, I can't, I can't take another year of med school. I know I want to be a doctor. I'm not going to delay this forever. So I went right back into my last two years of med school doing those clinicals and then moving forward into residency. So I think for me, it's really always been about being really clear on what my priorities are and then staying focused on those and not being afraid to re-examine and shift them as needed. That sounds to me like you're talking a little bit about expectations because I also think like people can misconstrue that. And I think people do all the time with like, what are your goals, right? Like, what are your dreams? But you're actually being really realistic about like, what are the expectations that I'm putting on myself? And how am I going to accomplish those things given this heavy load, right? On both sides, like you're training a lot and you have demands, you know, for the year ahead of med school, you may have some expectation of what that's going to be like, but you don't know exactly what it's going to be like. That's a really important takeaway point for me. And I'm sure for other people is like, you know, you have to be realistic. I think so often people try to do too much and they end up sort of falling on their face a little bit. And then that, that sense of 
defeat or failure sets them back. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with failure. I actually think failure is like fantastic for people. But I think the idea that you're sort of saying like, okay, is this possible? If it is, how am I going to break it down? What does it look like? And then when the plan changes, you're not going to throw the other half of the plan away. Right. And I think I learned a lot during that first year of med school, as I kind of mentioned earlier. So going into it, I actually did have some idea of what it was going to be like, because my husband had been a year ahead of me. So I had seen him go through that year. So he's the guinea pig. He's the guinea pig, basically, for our whole lives. Um, But so I saw him go through the year before. So I kind of knew what to expect. And I knew it was going to be feasible. And also back in that time, that was 2011, 12. People were not, it it was different. By the time it got to like to 2014, the amount of time I was spending on training was definitely much more. In 2012, I was probably spending three or four hours, three, four hours a day, maybe. And then it became more than that. Just because it became so much more competitive. Yeah, it was still earlier on, I would say, in the evolution of the games. So I knew it was feasible and I went into it and I think there was also, I was also going through a lot of other things at that time. It was just, you know, transition, moving. I had lost some family members during that time of transitioning and starting med school. I really wasn't happy with how I had finished at the games in 2011 and took some time to process that. And so I really struggled, I would say for the first six months, six to seven months of that year, really even having motivation to train and feeling like I was even enjoying what I was doing. So I went through sort of this, this ended up sort of having a mental breakdown and being like, I remember talking to my mom on the phone one night and she said, you know, you don't have to do any of this. She's like, you can drop out of med school today. You can stop training for the CrossFit Games today. We're still going to love you the same. It's not going to change anything. You should only do these things if you really want to do them. What a nice mom. I know, right? She's the best. (laughs) So it really made me stop and think a little bit more because I had always, you know, when you go into med school, you really think a lot about why you want to be a doctor and you write your personal statement. And I was very clear on that. But for CrossFit, I had never really stopped to think about it. So I kind of started it and I was good at it. And then I made it to the game. So then, of course, I wanted to do it again the next year. But I never really stopped to think about why I wanted to do it or why it was important to me. And so that really triggered me to go through that process of really thinking about why it was important. And once I went through that process and it became clear, then training became really fun again and everything kind of fell into place. And like we said, that was my best year at the games. And so I think for me, that was an important year to really, it it really taught me the importance of purpose in our lives, no matter what we're doing you know, life is too short to be doing a bunch of things that you don't really care about. There are definitely things we have to do in life that maybe aren't directly linked to like our purpose for being here on this earth. And you have to do certain things to to get, you know, to get to places that you want to go. But I think for me, keeping the big picture in mind, and part of that process was also thinking about the big picture of my career and how these two things were going to intersect. And I think that gave me a lot of purpose too, for wanting to continue with competing. So tell me a little bit about that. I mean, it sounds almost like you came up with your own personal statement about being a CrossFit athlete. What did that involve? Like what was included in that in terms of sort of sense of purpose when it comes to you identifying with the work that goes into that? Yeah. So I think there were a few things. I think I realized that I did have some, you know, natural talent to be able to compete at that level and not everyone has that opportunity. I, you Most know, I people do not. <laughs> yeah. Lots, lots of other people that I was training with that were doing the same workouts as, as me that were not qualifying in the CrossFit Games. And so that is a huge privilege. The other thing that I really loved about competing was from the time I started until that time, I had improved so much. And it was amazing to see the things that your body is capable of or doing things that you, you don't even expect yourself to do and really surprising yourself and doing things that like, you never could have imagined you could do. And so that to me was another motivating factor to say, I'm here in my early mid twenties and I want to be able to push my body and see what I'm capable of. And then I think probably the bigger, most important driving factor for me was really seeing how by me competing on that stage or on that, on that platform, 
could have an impact on other people. And that it was at first, it's very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable for me because I am not the kind of person who likes to necessarily be in the spotlight. But to have a conversation with someone who said, I saw you competing and it, you know, motivated me to make a change in my own life or it, you know, in some way impacted them, that really meant a lot to me. And I saw that just by doing something that I enjoyed doing and that I wanted to, you know, I had this talent for, I could positively impact other people and potentially help them become healthier. That to me really unified with my goal of being a physician and helping people to live healthier lives. And so that's really where it all came together to think about this is just another avenue that I can use the talents that I have to be able to positively influence other people to live healthier lives. Well, and I think the other part of that really goes to the sort of sense of integrity that you have. Because plenty of doctors tell people to do things that they don't do themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like here you are becoming a real role model to a lot of people who are watching you compete. Whereas in med school, you're going from, you know, sort of like different patient to patient, or like you're not really building relationships with people yet. And even if you do, there's often such a sort of iron curtain, right, between like a doctor sharing anything personal about their life with a patient, which, you know, is probably unfortunate, right? Because if we could all relate more to our doctors, <laughs> we would probably <laughs> follow their advice more. I mean, I can only imagine. I feel that way as a reporter often, like, you know, it's interesting on the podcast because I share my own stories. Whereas when I was at 2020 in primetime or any print stories I've ever done, when I interview people, I'm always sharing but it never makes it into the story, right. <laughs> right? So it's like a totally new thing. And I'll be like, Jill, did I just say that about my mother? Like, we have to delete that. We can't include it. But I mean, I think to your point, like, that's really, I think that's incredibly powerful. That is a really important point that like, here you are on this stage, becoming like, really like sort of the it girl of the CrossFit world, right? And also going to med school and wanting to genuinely care and treat people who are sick, right, or help people stay healthy, that makes so much sense that there's a convergence that happens for you mentally. Did that make you commit more to CrossFit, you think? Oh, definitely, 100%. And I think seeing, like I said, it wasn't just, oh, I can do this and, you know, be an example for patients in terms of living a healthy lifestyle, but it was also seeing how CrossFit itself really has the potential to really change someone's life and change their health around. And, and through the exercise, but through the community, through the nutrition, through all the other ways that CrossFit touches people. And I was seeing that in the gym and I saw how that was a much more effective tool for many people than what we were doing in medicine. And so I knew that was going to come back around and be something that I wanted to really utilize in my practice. Did your med school colleagues like have any idea of your sort of like celebrity within the CrossFit world? Like, was that weird? Um, they did. So we had a small, <laughs> we had two people in our class. It was small. So I remember, I think it was that first year, the first summer when I competed in the 2011 games, it was just a couple months after we had started. And then I think the ESPN shows came out in the fall. And I remember watching them at one of my classmates' houses and it was really funny, but Yes, they knew. And they some of them like I, I did an event at our gym and invited a bunch of them to try it and learn about it. I've always tried to just educate people about what CrossFit is, because I think there's so much misinformation about out there and people's perceptions and first impressions are often maybe not necessarily representative of what CrossFit is. So I always try to share that with the people I'm working with or through my classmates or my co-residents. And then one of the other things that I feel like I've always been struck by in terms of just, I mean, and we saw this with like, like this was like the first time when the women's soccer team won mm -hmm. and they were actually respected as athletes, right? Like rather than like being hot athletes or like, you know what I mean? Like sort of <laughs> this, like, you know, it is what it is. Like I, but I think it's so interesting because I feel like in CrossFit, people really respect the women for their performance, right? Like, it's like, can you do this? And how well can you do it? And I wonder, you know, if you would just sort of like talk a little bit about what that's like in terms of like pushing yourself physically in a way that I feel like a lot of top performing female athletes have to do. But in CrossFit, it seems like it's a little bit different in the sense that like, you know, people will talk about how CrossFit women are like so strong or they're so buff or like whatever. And it sometimes feels to me almost like they're trying to take away 
Like that's not normally people who are in the CrossFit community, right? It's like outsiders who are thinking about the women in a different way. But I feel like for me, CrossFit feels like a very feminist Mm -hmm. kind of experience. Like whether you're an elite athlete or you're somebody like me who just really enjoys the workouts because I'm on the floor (laughs) hyperventilating when I'm done and I know I've worked really hard, even if it's only for like five minutes, right? But I think as a woman, it's also really interesting because it's like I am not self-conscious at all while I'm working out. I am literally just trying to get the best time I can get or, you know, really like get as close to doing an RX as I can, which I'm, you know, still pretty scaled. And so I wonder what that was like for you, having like been a gymnast or played these other sports. Like, was there any difference for you or is it like when you're, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I also feel like sometimes when I talk to like professional athletes, mostly men who I've interviewed. They'll be like, I don't even notice the crowd, right? Like, I don't, I'm so zeroed in. I'm not even thinking about it. And so maybe you were always like that because you were an athlete when you were younger as well. But I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about this sort of like female athlete side of it. Definitely. So I would say for me, initially, before I even thought about competing, that is what drew me to CrossFit. And what, what I loved was that suddenly I could go to the gym, I could be part of a community, I could have a coach, I could sweat next to all these people. And it didn't matter at all about what I looked like, or how many calories were on the elliptical, or, you know, what I ate that day, it was just about, are you pushing yourself? Are you getting better every day? The people around you are doing the same. And there's so much I think that really that's where the community comes from is that bonds people together from going through that experience of pushing yourself and, and just trying to be better in general. And so I think that's one of the best things that I love about CrossFit. And as far as being a female in CrossFit is for me, it really helped me to take away really any thoughts that I had, or not any thoughts, but it definitely helped me to improve my overall relationship with my body body image, self-confidence, because it was all about these things that I could do in the gym. And it wasn't about what I looked like or how many calories I ate or, you know, whatever I did on the elliptical that day, which is, I think, what used to consume a lot of my thoughts when I was working out that way before. So that right away was really big. And then seeing, you know, the first, when I first started, I remember watching videos of the previous year of CrossFit Games and just watching the women and being so impressed with everything that they were doing. And you know, I never imagined that one day I would be there too. But I think there's just such great role models in terms of women that are just, they're just working hard and they're doing their thing. And they're not, it's not necessarily about what you look like in the mirror at all. I think a lot of CrossFit gyms don't have mirrors for a reason. It's just about pushing yourself and, and getting better. And so I love that. And I think I've always loved how the CrossFit Games has really been a very level playing field for women and men. So they always have had the same prize money for women and men ever since the beginning. Women are generally very, I think, respected in the CrossFit community. I love that you can go into a CrossFit gym. A lot of, you know, a lot of guys that, you know, maybe think they're in shape and they go in to try a CrossFit workout for the first time and there's going to be women in that gym who are going to beat them. Mm -hmm. It's super cool. (laughs) And now now to see as CrossFit has grown and as it's been 10 years since I started to see how many young girls are coming up in this environment where they're learning these skills early on and they're learning to be proud of their muscles. And, you know, I remember kind of getting made fun of for having big arms when I was younger, when I was a gymnast or, you know, maybe not made fun of, but it was just something that was different about me. And now I think there's a lot of girls who think that's really cool and who want to be strong like their mom someday. And that, that to me is, is really exciting to see what this next generation is going to be able to do because they have a positive fitness community surrounding them as they're growing up. Yeah, I love that. And I think, I, I mean, I think there's probably nothing better for little girls to have than to have like an outlet that's all about strength, right? And ability. I mean, I also think like the other thing for me about CrossFit is that that I think a lot of people don't understand is that, yes, you can compete against other people, but most Mm -hmm. of the time you're competing against yourself. So like I have people, I have friends who are like, oh, I'm not that competitive. And I'm like, when you say that, I know you're talking about (laughs) me, right? (laughs) Right. But I'm also like, no, it's about you. Like you're trying to beat your own score from the last time you did that workout, right? That's really cool because, I mean, and it's sort of like this idea of everything being measurable. And I think that that's just like a structure that 
really pushes you, like it just inherently pushes you. So it's not like your trainer's like, oh, come on, you can do 10 more reps, mm-hmm. right? You're like, I can do 10 more. I've got to get to 10 more. Right. And I think it's interesting because there's two different things. I think that one, it is competing with yourself every day. And at the end of the day, that's what matters is that you, ha- you know, things are measurable. You can set a goal that next time you want to be a little bit faster or lift a little bit more or whatever it is. But then I think there's something too that I've learned over the past few years because I've gone in and out of different, you know, I've worked out by myself more at times and in a class at other times. And there is so much to say for working out in a group environment where, you know, I don't necessarily have to be lifting the same amount of weight as the person next to me. Like this morning, I was doing a class and there was a guy in front of me. Obviously, he had a lot more weight on the bar, but I was trying to keep up with him as far as the rounds and the workout. And if I had been doing that workout on my own, there's no way I would have pushed myself that hard. And so I think there is something about using the positive aspects of not necessarily maybe competition, but just trying to push yourself a little bit more that you get by working out around other people. Um, But I think sometimes it can be hard for people to do that because maybe it makes them feel bad if they can't keep up or it's, it's sort of, you have to kind of know yourself and know your pace, but then use the people around you in a positive way to get the most out of yourself. That's the other thing is that it it doesn't ever feel like, you know, like a gold's gym environment where like people are annoyed that you're using the weights or like that you (laughs) don't know what you're doing. Right. I mean, I feel like everybody's always encouraging and I'm sure they're encouraging of you because you're this like amazing athlete, but people are encouraging of me too. And I think that is really the community part of it. That's sort of everybody starts from different places and then people sort of progress through. But it's this idea of like, we're all in it together, right? I think that's really sort of magical in a way and interesting too, because I think that also pushes you, right? Because you're like, oh, these people are like encouraging me. Like, like I got this. Right. Right. I wish that it wasn't so uncommon, but I think it is. I mean, it's something really special. I don't know what it is, but in general, the people that you find in the CrossFit community are just going to be good people and they're going to want to encourage the people around them. It's going to be a positive environment. Do you have any great like sort of excuse busters for like, when people are feeling like, oh, I've started this new exercise regimen, but you know, I'm really busy today, or I don't feel up to it. Like, I'm sure you have days like that. What do you tell yourself? Yeah, I mean, I've, I think it depends. So I think for me, I have sort of a minimum that I know I need to work out this many times in a week. For me, it's usually like, I mean, three at the very minimum, but four is what I shoot for. And I know if I at least get that many, I'm going to do okay. If I start to drop below that, I start to not feel like myself and I get irritable and it's just not good to be around me. So I think you have to know what your number, you know, what your number is, you know, sometimes you do need to sleep or sometimes like you're sleep deprived, you have a lot going on and sometimes it is better to rest and that's okay. And you need to know when, when that's okay to do, but sometimes it can help just to do something small. So it doesn't have to be necessarily going to a class, but do a quick workout at home. My husband and I have been doing a lot of these five minute workouts in the morning. So we call them our morning fives. And we do sometimes it's just stretching. Sometimes it's 20 burpees. Sometimes it's some squats or whatever we come up with. But that's a way just to make sure that you do something and sort of get your blood flowing and your heart pumping a little bit. And oftentimes, you feel so much better just after doing that. So, you know, in summary, it's okay to rest, but no, don't make it a habit. You can't have an excuse every single day. So Mm -hmm. I know as long as I get in four workouts in a week, I'm going to be doing okay for me. And then on those days where maybe you're super busy and you haven't gotten in your four workouts, then do something quick at home. At least that's better than nothing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a good point. And I also think like the mental health aspect of it is a big one. I, you know, I think... There is tons of research to back up this idea that exercise, it's not just the endorphins, it's like all kinds of neurotransmitters that are working hard when you're working out. And it like definitely can help pull people out of a depression and keep you from falling into one. So I feel like we're sitting here in Boston, and it's like dark and gloomy. (laughs) It's like, you know, it's so easy to say like, oh, I'm too tired, right? Or like, it's gross out, I don't want to go anywhere. Like, but It's like, that's the moment I feel like for me anyway, where I'm like, now you have to go because because you said that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so true. And I've seen that. I feel that a hundred percent. I mean, there's been times I remember when I, during my first year of residency, there was about a two week stretch where I just, I didn't work out at all. And 
I kept making excuses. And then it does become hard to overcome that momentum. I think getting back into it is super hard. But immediately, I went to the gym, pushed myself through a workout. It wasn't fun. But immediately after that, I felt like a new person. And that's where I've kind of figured out, okay, four workouts a week, that's sort of my minimum. And I think you have to figure that out for yourself, what you need for your mental health. I sometimes joke that I feel like if I don't work out for a certain period of time, it's like bumping into an ex-boyfriend or like, you're like, this is going to be awkward, like when I go back, but I know it's going to be fine after the first couple of minutes, like we'll probably get along and it won't be weird. Like, you know, I feel like it's a little bit like that. If you like get out of the habit of going, you're like, oh, I gotta go. But then you get in there and you're like, this is fantastic. It's fun. And I might like, I mean, I think your morning workouts, which I feel like you guys post on Instagram sometimes. Yeah. They're great too, because I think once you get your body moving, you want it to keep moving. Like very rarely do you do like a mini workout and think like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to do right. anymore. Right. Your body right. gets moving and you're like, oh yeah, I should go for a run or like I should do something else. I feel like sometimes it's like remembering to turn it off. That's sometimes harder. It's so true. I remember there was a, the old, one of the old, the deans that are in my med school, she would always use this quote of action before motivation. So if you wait around for motivation to come to start working out, you might wait forever. But if you just start taking action, then usually the motivation is going to follow. So just like you said, if you get yourself to the gym, you're going to start doing something. Or if you do five minutes, then you're going to want to maybe do a little bit more. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's because your body likes it, right? Like it's, it's good for it. Oh, yeah. And it feels good. I feel like the last thing that I wanted to make sure we just talked a little bit about is how you've sort of thought about being a perfectionist and sort of modifying that view, which I think so many women especially feel like, oh, I'm not living up to the expectation that I had. And I mean expectation in a different way than what we sort of alluded to earlier, which is like really sort of setting your game plan. And I think the idea of being a little gentle with yourself especially through transitional periods, is such good advice. And I feel like it's something you've written a little bit about and I know you've talked about, but I would just love for you to sort of share some ideas of how your thoughts on that, I guess, have evolved as you've gone through this experience. It's still definitely a work in progress. I was a gymnast. I was very much a perfectionist when it came to school and sports. And I think that obviously did me very well and put, you know set me up for success. but then in a lot of ways, I think once you get out into the real world, <laughs> you realize that that's not always the best way to approach life. And so I think I am learning how to channel that energy to specific areas and not to let it sort of overtake my entire life. And so now I definitely, and I think for me, part of that experience was you know, I learned a lot of that through CrossFit and through my competitive career, because going through challenges like having to take that year off and then come back, or even during that year, I remember CrossFit had asked me to come and form the or film the movement demos for the open workouts. And I remember feeling so self conscious, because I thought, gosh, I haven't even been training I'm about to do these open workouts in front of the whole world. And I'm, you know, I've all I've been doing is studying and I'm so out of shape. And of course, you know, I was still in very good shape, but just not where I would have liked to be had I been training for competition. I got there and it was such an amazing opportunity. And, you know, I did it and it was fine. You know, like everyone understands that you have life going on. And and so I think that was a good experience for me to go through to say, hey, you're not going to be always on your A game, you can't be perfect at everything all the time. And at that particular time in my life, studying and preparing for my board exam was taking the priority and and that's okay. I, I you know, if you put all of your energy into one thing to try to be as perfect as you can at it, then that means there's a million other things in your life that are not going to be very good. For me, it's been about identifying what are those things that are really important that I want to put my energy into. Um, and focusing energy there, but then being forgiving of myself, realizing that you can't do it all. There's only 24 hours in a day and being okay with, you know, I'm doing the best that I can right now, given the, the circumstances and given what I have to work with and being okay with that and trying to have more positive self-talk in terms of getting a little bit better every day or working towards a goal. And instead of thinking negatively about 
you know, things that I wish I had gotten done or things that I didn't do as well as I wanted to. You know, it's so funny to hear you say that stuff because I'm sure nobody watched those videos and thought you were out of shape, right? Right, right. But it's like you're going to be your own worst critic. You know, the flip side is, at least for me, that I feel like perfection would be so boring, right? right. Like if you actually achieved perfection and you weren't working on anything anymore, like that would be time to quit. I remember somebody when I got married gave me the this advice and it was like at a shower or something where like the, everybody was reading advice. And so it was like sort of this weird, awkward moment. And she was my set, like basically like a second mom to me. She was a mom of a friend of mine I had grown up with and I love her and I feel like it's some of the best advice. And it, she basically was like, you never want to be content. You always want to be working on your relationship. That's such a strange thing to say to somebody who's about to get married, right? Who's like, I've arrived. I don't have to worry about dating anymore. Like, right, like let me just celebrate. I want to be content. <laughs> <laughs> like, but it's great advice because the point is like, no, you're always learning new things about your partner and you're always learning new things about yourself. And that should require recalibration along the way and growth, right? And growth is sometimes really painful. And so if we reach the point where we're not trying to grow anymore, that kind of, to me, means you're not learning anymore. And if you're not learning anymore, then like you should die. I mean, like, what's the point of life if you're not learning, right? So I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. <laughs> and he talks about how he talks about it more in terms of balance, because you know, how everyone says, Oh, I'm just I'm searching for balance. And I just want balance in my life. And he uses the analogy of being on a teeter totter. And he's like, so, you know, teeter totter, you're going back and forth. He's like, so if you achieve balance, what are you doing? You're just <laughs> looking across from someone staring at them. And he's like, not moving. What's, what's going to happen? Like, what's, what fun is that? Mm -hmm. So it is, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, I think complacency is the enemy. And anytime that you just get comfortable and like you said, are just not growing anymore. Um, I don't think that's very satisfying. And I think that where we, at least for me, I think where, where I get a lot of my excitement in life and pleasure and joy is from those moments of growing and learning and doing something new. And so it's just been for me sort of embracing that and being patient with myself and being forgiving of myself and, and trying to let go of a little bit of that perfectionistic tendency or wanting to try to have control over everything all the time. Yeah, I feel like I have a tendency to become so myopic on something I want to achieve that I like lose sight of the things that I am achieving in the, you know what I mean, in real time. And so I feel like one of the things that I've learned as I've gotten older is just sort of, it's okay. It's sort of like having a rest day, right? Like have a moment of reflection. Yeah. Take a second and think about where you were 10 years ago. Like 10 years isn't that long. Mm -hmm. And you've done so much, right? And like, that's something to really take a second and feel proud of. I'm Emily Kummler, and that was Empowered Health. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to check out our website at empoweredhealthshow.com for all the show notes linked to everything that was mentioned in the episode, as well as a chance to sign up for our newsletter and get some extra fun tidbits. See you next week.